jump in, <laughs> shoot it on your phone. You know, th these days, the, the, me the means, the barriers to entry have disappeared. You can edit it on your laptop. You can shoot it on your phone. Jump in, start, do it, do it, and, and see if you really want to do it because it takes a huge amount of work. So Today's show is sponsored by Enigma Elements. As filmmakers, we're always looking for ways to level up production value of our projects and speed up our workflow. This is why I created Enigma Elements, your one-stop shop for film grains, color grading LUTs, vintage analog textures like VHS and CRT images, smoke, fog textures, DaVinci Resolve presets, and much more. After working as an editor, colorist, post, and VFX supervisor for almost 30 years, I know what film creatives need to level up their projects. Check out EnigmaElements.com and use the coupon code IFH10 to get 10% off your order. I'll be adding new elements all the time. Again, that's Enigma, E-N-I-G-M-A, elements.com. I'd like to welcome to the show Peter and Paula, documentary filmmakers extraordinaire. Thanks for being on the show, guys. Thanks for having us, yeah. Alex. I am a huge fan of, uh, of your work, specifically the movie Awake, which is one of the reasons why I wanted you to have on the show, not only because of uh, the topic of the, of the movie uh, and it being one of my favorite documentaries, but also the, uh, the process of how you made it, how you got it out there, and we're going to go into all that kind of stuff. But before we get into that, first, how did you guys get into the film business in the first place? Hmm. <laughs> go ahead, Peter. <laughs> Um, I got the bug in college. I took this, I was searching for what I wanted to do. It started like in physics and math. Then I went into economics. I thought that was going to be practical. And then I just took this one filmmaking class and the light bulb went off. It was like, oh my God, this is it. This is what I want to do my whole life. So and then I just headed for Hollywood and, and then I met Paula. Nah, how, and, how, and you guys have been, you guys work together, correct? We do. And, and my background was uh, really in the news with Italian television. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, it was, uh, I just, before that, when I was a kid, I was an actress. And mm -hmm. so um, the whole idea of slipping into other people's shoes and seeing the world through other points of view has been like, I think, a part of just who I am. Mm -hmm. And so the natural progression from short form to long form, and then really wanting to have a voice and tell the narrative um, to really, you know, storytelling um, in nonfiction, having a stronger narrative was what I was attracted to. That's what brought me to documentary films. Now, how, 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 how is it challenging working together as a couple? Because I had a business with my wife and it was, <laughs> and it was, and it was wonderful. Um, but uh, it's challenging. So how, and, and, and we weren't creative. So I can only imagine the, um, the discussions. So how is it working together as, how do you work together as a couple? Divorce is not an option. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what's, what's, what's fun about our story is that our, we made a film during our courtship. We actually oh. um, met and um, we actually connected on, on, on the level of sort of union archetypes. We were within our first 30 minutes of talking to each other. We were talking about union archetypes and it was like, OK, this girl is cool. <laughs> um, and um, she had this burning desire to tell a story about um, expression, the need to, to find your voice as an artist and to express. And she had a perfect vehicle for this, for this story, which is this violin virtuoso that Paola, you grew up with. Mm -hmm. I grew up with not just Lerna Sonnenberg, who was a world-class violinist. Mm -hmm. And her mother was my piano teacher. And I just, you know, was always far more interested in her than I was in my piano lessons. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what spawned the idea of making my first independent film, Speaking in Strings. And I had just met Peter. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, uh, Peter was a huge um, impetus for me actually diving into that. So I was working on it. I was trying to do it, but I was waiting for everything to be perfect, the funding to come in and all of that. And he's the one who just said, let me shoot this. I know how to shoot. I just like clapper loader, <laughs> you know, Dino you know, De Laurentiis, you know, let me do this. And um, I think we started out with just like Nacho was coming to town and needed to do, I needed to take him up on his offer. Sure. And that's how we started first working together. But during the course of making that film, um, you know, we were dating and then uh, we were traveling together. Then he popped the question and then we had a all, during, all during yeah. that movie. 
Yeah, all during the movie. All during the making of Speaking in Strings. And then we went to Sundance. You left out the marriage before having the baby. Oh, right, you're right. There there was a wedding. There was a wedding in there. (laughs) Then there was a baby. And then we're we're like, you know, we got the baby and the baby Bjorn at Sundance at the Q&A. Oh, that's that's brilliant. I was pregnant at Sundance. But we we brought Mateo, our first son, we brought around with us to, um, you know, festivals. Because he was, you know, sleeping in a drawer and, you know, just that kind of a thing. That's amazing. Yeah. (laughs) Because I was a big believer, you know, in in, you just dive in, you just start, you start, you know, you don't, you can't wait. Nothing's perfect. It's never perfect. And we began that film on literally a little, you know, you know, consumer high eight camera. Mm -hmm. It ended up, you know, being nominated for an Academy Award. Oh my God, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, Peter's a hugely inspirational coach and teacher. Like I have to say, he's taught at Harvard and some other places and he's just really, um, very inspirational. And so part of why I think it works for us to work together mm-hmm. is that, um, you know, I, I, it's, it's just that keeping, helping to keep the inspiration alive in each other. So he loves the process of filmmaking, but he was a writer mm. and I was a filmmaker and I just, you know, maybe it was more like not as dive in, you mm-hmm. know, insecure a little bit trying to find my way and here's this guy who's just like dive in let's do this and you know (laughs) i'm gonna do it with you you know that kind of a thing and um and i really did find my voice in the making of that film so that's awesome yeah now peter when you when you said you took a film class early on uh what made you go to documentary as opposed to narrative Um, so I went to Harvard, which is the opposite of a film school. I was about to say, I've not seen many Harvard film school grads that have <laughs> taken what, 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 what they own. They have this total bias towards documentaries and not just oh, documentaries, okay. highly personal documentaries. We, the joke was at Harvard, you had to, to make a film at Harvard, you had to grow a beard, do a personal documentary that involves a, the birth of one of your children <laughs> and make sure that you pan across a mirror as often as possible to show your beard. That, that is a Harvard documentary. And many people at Harvard were making those. In fact, Ross McElwee, Sherman's March, you know, created that form with the, doc- movie. You know, right. the diary cam. This was a movie that really transformed documentary filmmaking. He still teaches at Harvard. But there was a whole generation of us that really were kind of, wanting to go to Hollywood and go to fiction, you know, and we really wanted to make commercial movies, not these really, you know, esoteric artsy documentaries. So <laughs> I started out on a fiction track and, you know, I made some low budget features um, as a director, mm-hmm. did some music videos first, and then kind of fell into writing. Um, it was sort of a dead end, this genre, low budget, you know, sort of um, AFM features were kind of like, do I really want to put my name on that? You know, so I started <laughs> writing and I had Beginner's luck. I saw my first script and it became a big studio movie. And then I was kind of on that studio writing track, sort of mm-hmm. the development hell writing track until I met her. You know, I basically um, got far away from what I had fallen in love with, which is actual hands on filmmaking. You know, that's what I love is, is the actual, you know, we, I started out with film cutting on, you know, on, on a steam bag. Mm-hmm. So uh, so when, when Pal and I met, she was like, you know, let's let's. Let's go to Sundance. Let's let's see real filmmaking. I'm like, yeah, let's do that. You know, so that was a breath of fresh air. You guys seem to be very yin and yang for each other. Uh, just <laughs> just by the s- small amount of time I've spent with you already and just of this conversation, you guys seem to balance each other quite well. The question is who's the yang and who's the yin? Well, that's a whole other question I will not get <laughs> into right now. It's out on Wednesday, you know, it just depends on the day. <laughs> <laughs> now, you guys did uh, an amazing documentary called Awake, which is arguably one of my favorite documentaries of all time, and I watch it all the time. Uh, I told you this when I met you guys uh, a while ago, and um, it, it's such a powerful film for me because I, I'm such a uh, a lover of Yogananda, a Paramahansa Yogananda's work. Can you talk a little bit about what, how this film came into the world, why you decided to go down? this path and honestly there hadn't been another documentary if i'm not mistaken correct about his life no um but there have been many people that have gone to the uh srf and Mm -hmm. to the organization to try to get the movie made Mm -hmm. i think that you know what happened was that the um direct disciples had been slowly passing away and that firsthand information um you know from those who actually lived with yogananda 
uh, mm-hmm. while he was here in the flesh, um, was it was it was very important, and I think it was important uh, historically as well as to his um, to his devotees. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, we made the film with uh, Lisa Lehman, who co-directed and co-wrote with me, and um, and co-produced with us. Um, and, you know, initially it wasn't, I mean, you know, you, when you make a film, you dive in and you're living, especially a documentary, you're living with the film for years. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's not something that um, I certainly take lightly. And I wasn't really sure that this was something that I wanted to do until we were sitting in a room with the monastics. And um, I was very impressed with the people that we were sitting with. And there was just something that happened in the room. I don't, I don't really know how else to say it, except for it was exploratory for us, but um, impressed with them and impressed with um, something about the timing of Yogananda, you know, he brought Priya Yoga. Mm-hmm. Can, you, can you, real quick, before we continue, can you explain a little bit to the audience who Yogananda was? Because I know, you, we all know who he is, but the audience might not know his work. Sure. Um, you want to take that? Sure. Um, so Yogananda is a Bengali Swami who was born in Calcutta in the 1890s and um, was the first sort of Hindu Swami to sort of moved to America permanently. He mm-hmm. lived here for 30 years. He arrived in 1920 and he brought basically yoga and meditation, he introduced it into America. There had been some other swamis, but Yogananda was the guy who stayed here the longest and really was going town to town, you know, concert hall to concert hall, basically giving these free lectures on yoga. And this was the era before radio, before television. So there was not a lot, you know, it was actually kind of a thrilling thing to do to go see the long haired (laughs) swami with the turban, you know, talk about these exotic practices in the East. And You know, he was so magnetic and so charismatic that he would just like trans, you know, electrify a room. There's a famous incident at Carnegie Hall where, you know, he actually got, you know, a thousand, whatever, fifteen hundred New Yorkers to chant with him for an hour in 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 Sanskrit. (laughs) And um, he just, you know, was doing his thing. And and, uh, And he he brought the these ancient teachings, he brought them and made them, uh, you know, practical in day to day life. He Mm. really gave how to live teachings, you know, how to um, be the best businessman that you could be, how to uh, how to live with maximum amounts of energy. You know, um, he would take sort of daily, everyday challenges of being human and he would apply the Sanatan Dharma teachings to that. And I think that that's what really um, hit home. But more importantly, he was teaching Kriya Yoga, which, you know, um, is a, a type of yoga it's, that works with energies in the spine. And, you know, the idea of, um, he would say this, that this, the altar of God is, is, in, is the brain, essentially, the spine and brain is the mm-hmm. altar. God. And what an interesting concept that we as human beings can, you know, actually activate energies within the body that um, connect us to um, a higher power. And that is really true, true freedom and true independence. So the notion of that, it was easier to, to understand these concepts of energy being accessed like that and worked with because of what was happening in science at Mm -hmm. the time. And so quantum physics was coming into play. And this was a new idea. And so people were connecting what Yogananda's message was and what he had to say about Kriya Yoga. And it was making a little bit more sense. They were able to access it a little bit better because of what was really unfolding in science at the time. And and this and for everyone listening, you have to understand that this was what the 20s? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, because now everything you just said, we complete. He would fall right into a lot of the conversations that are happening there. But he was the way he looked back in the twenties. Can you imagine? No one yeah. had ever seen. It was many, head. Spinning. It, it was, was head spitting. Exactly. Yeah. You talk about a, a, and he, he, even the notion of you know he took Christ and Krishna and put them side by side on his altar and said they're this basically the same dude. They're two sides of the same coin. Mm-hmm. You know, and he would he worshipped um, uh, the divine in the form of the feminine divine mother. Mm -hmm. That was also a radical concept. You know, we were Christians and we were 
you know, basically indoctrinated with this idea of this sort of bearded God with the lightning bolts, you know, <laughs> right. and that was your only access point. And, it, you know, in, in, in Vedanta, there, there's this very expansive notion of divinity. You know, divinity can just be a feeling. It can be the feeling of peace. You know, that can be your God. You know, you could cultivate devotion to to whatever your point of entry is. It's a very attractive mm. philosophy. And, um, you know, Yogananda went on later in his life in, in the 40s. He wrote this sort of seminal book, Autobiography of a Yogi, in which he talked about his own quest for his guru and as a boy and running around Calcutta and looking and searching and wanting to connect with this feeling that he you know, was longing for. And um, it's, it's such a popular book. I mean, it's been translated into over 30 languages. Oh, yeah. I think 30 million people may have read it. And, you know, one of the most famous is Steve Jobs. And he wrote, read that book all the time. And apparently it was the only book on his iPad at the time of his death. He also gave out 800 copies at his memorial service. So it's one of these gateway books that many, many people read. So, And it also changed the Beatles' life as well, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't have had uh, Sergeant Pepper, I think, without his visit to India, right? Or was it before or after? Uh, Sergeant Pepper was before, but okay. uh, we wouldn't have you had. Have the cover, right? and they, you put the gurus on the cover. Of the no, Sergeant... the Yogananda is on the cover of Sergeant yeah, Pepper. Yeah, but it was before they went to India. Uh, okay. Sergeant Pepper '67. They went to India in '68. But we wouldn't have, you know, across the universe and let sure. it be. All you need is love, and and yeah. you know, all these exalted songs. Yes, we're part of the. So, I so think... you're taking this undertaking of of telling the story of this uh, immense figure. In, yeah. in history, um, there's a lot of, uh, I would imagine a lot of pressure on you to do it right. <laughs> I mean, there's people like, and you, like you said, many filmmakers and many other people have tried to do this and gone to the the center of self-realization where, um, where it's basically the hub of all things Yogananda and they've been rejected. So when you guys got the keys um, <laughs> and let the, the lunatics run the asylum in a way, um, <laughs> how did that feel? And, 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 and again, why did you want to tell this story as, as a documentarian? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I would say, you know, funny, ignorance is bliss in this case, you right. know, because I think and, and to the credit of um, the organization who opened up their archives, I mean, they had to be a part of this because they had to open up their archives. And there were outside um you know, devotees um, that had wanted to see the film made, right? And, uh, but they wanted, they stipulated that it had to be outside filmmakers. So I thought that that was really, it's interesting. That was, that was an entryway. That was certainly of interest to us. The fact that they were seeking outside filmmakers made it really um, attractive to us so that there was an interest in, in sort of beginner's mind. And beginner's mind is a beautiful thing. Um, you know, we don't have that anymore. We've been like, you know, deeply entrenched in his teachings now. And so it's a whole different thing. And, and I think there, that, that that's, that's what we were looking at. So we were filmmakers, we knew how to tell a story. We had a certain openness to this. We had been yoga practitioners, meditators, Lisa as well. Um, you know, uh, so we were all coming from a place of meditation and yoga being a part of our lives. But I think for me, the, the, this, the sort of yoga as a science, which is the way it's often seen, um, you know, in the East, I mean, that, that was very interesting to me that there was this methodical approach to self-realization that you could actually take, a, you know, um, these techniques and apply them to your life and do them. And just kind of see what happens that you, the human being was, you know, you were your own scientist and your body was your laboratory mm -hmm. and you could take these things and try them and like an experiment, just notice and observe and see what was unfolding before you. So that was very attractive to me, especially given the times that we're living in right now. Mm. You know, I would say it's so obvious that we are living out of balance on this planet and it doesn't really matter what side of the aisle you're on. You know, it's, um, it's almost like, you know, science and technology, we've advanced so much in that regard. Um, but we haven't really balanced it out with our spiritual human. So, 
uh, yoga is really the, it's the science of balance. It's the sun and the moon. It's the energy of opposites. It's bringing balance into our lives and harnessing, um, you know, the, the, these energies brings us, brings the self to the highest self, right? It, it trans, it trans, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it's, um, it transcends. It transcends. Exactly. It's a way of, it's transcendence. We can transcend the limitations of the body and of the mind in that process. Now, when you guys, oh, go, ahead. go ahead, Peter. I was just going to say that, you know, one of um, Yogananda's um, quotes, great quotes, is that, you know, the ideal future um, would be a combination of the ancient wisdom of the East and the modern advancements and technological material progress of the West. Mm -hmm. You know, this idea of synthesis, that, that we're so skewed towards the material paradigm now. I mean, in terms of the message that was blasting across all the media channels and everything, it's buy, 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 me, 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 more, more, acquire, acquire, you know, that's your, right. that's, that's your, that's where you can get your contentment. And yet there are these ancient teachings that are so much more profound and ultimately lead to a much more content state of being. And if we can balance the yeah. two, you know, then, then we really have hope here in the future. So that that was a really attractive aspect of, of his message and, you know, one of the things that we wanted to bring in to the film. And I think that nowadays uh, there is definitely something changing. I mean, from the time that where he was around to the point now where meditation is now not a, a weird thing. You know, yoga is not a weird thing. It is in some parts of the country, but in a lot of places, it's still something that's spoken of. And that's basically from his genesis, from the work that he put in. So uh, again, I think the undertaking of what you guys were going after was pretty massive, uh, pressure-wise. Uh, as a, it, it was a huge challenge. And I think that not knowing or understanding quite the pressure that we were under, there was, <laughs> was you know, like I was saying, hey, this is plus. I think that that's the only way you get through these things, mm -hmm. right? Um, they say it's like childbirth. You shouldn't know what that's like because <laughs> you won't do it. <laughs> You will never have children if you actually knew what was going to happen. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think that the challenge was also, I mean, the three of us very often sat in the editing room really grappling with, you know, some of the biggest questions in life, you know, <laughs> about the human condition. And just, it was great to have different points of view when we were all bringing different things into that as our entry point. Now, um, what is your process when you do a pre-production on a documentary? Since I know the, the narrative pre-production process, I have no clue of the documentary process how how do you pre how long is pre-production what do you do what's the process it really depends on the film I, I i look at each film as its own uh has its own identity has mm -hmm. its own needs you mm -hmm. know and you really look at the needs of the film but in general there's you know a, a pretty hefty research process you really you really need to go into um, understanding the subject that you're researching and to read and to take in information to organize that information but at the same time you're really coming um, what you're doing while you're doing all of that is you're gestating this process of what is the what is the narrative that's trying to be told i look at it as for me projects often are choosing me even if i think i'm choosing them you know, like with Speaking in Strings, my first film, but really it was choosing me because it was trying to draw out from me something that I had to experience and go through. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And I, I really believe that that's, the, you know, so much what the creative process is really all about. So, you know, um, you end up just bowing to it. You know, you do your research and you're trying to, at the same time, put your antennas up and listen and receive what the message is or what is that narrative that's trying to unfold here. Mm -hmm. And in this case, we, um, you know, we, we put together a treatment. Um, it was a massive, you know, thing to oh. try to put this together. Oh. And so, you know, we, we did about six months mm -hmm. of, of an R&D phase. We, we, we literally call it an R&D phase. And, and we've done that on several projects now. It's such a sort of a healthy way of jumping in, which is, okay, for the next three to six months, we're just exploring. We're going to do some exploratory shooting. We'll do a couple of interviews, maybe some shoot some, you know, uh, sequences. We're, we're also going to do, you know, hire a team and start getting in there and, you know, doing research and archival research. And then we're going to start creating a palette of what this film could be and, you know, start to, as Paula says, 
what is the film that is wanting to emerge? And one of the things, you know, Paola has been a great teacher to me um, in, in all of this. Um, you know, since I started in the narrative form where you begin with the script, here's the script. Now we're going to go make the movie and here's the template. Here's the blueprint for the movie. Well, in documentaries, it's the exact reverse, which is the script is the lap you write on the timeline as you edit. And, um, you know, the organization kept asking us for a script. In fact, I think we even had a contractual obligation to produce a script. And we're like, we're not writing a script. You know, we're, we'll, the script will be the transcript of the final cut. When, when we have locked cut, we can transcribe it and that will be your script because the film needs to be discovered, you know, it, to, 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 for it to be authentic, you know, it needs to be found. There are different ways to do it. I mean, you know, you're, if you're cranking out documentaries for TV and stuff, you know, you mm -hmm. just script and you're, you're using B-roll, you know, mm -hmm. but I think that this was more of an exploratory process. And um, we went from, you know, treatment to outline to discovering the language of the film on the timeline. All right. And, and, and then um, actually starting to create cuts. Now, uh, one of the things I loved about the movie, too, is the um, the reenactments are so beautifully done and they're so wonderfully placed throughout the story. How important do you think that is um, in your process and, and is something that more documentaries should have? Because I always love reenactments when they're done well, uh, when they're <laughs> shot well. I've seen some that haven't been shot that well. That's but. Like but if I you love shoot them well. saying that that is so that is so awesome that you appreciated them i mean it was it was actually a big battle to to get the reenactments done um, really in what, in what way well you know um in other words uh we weren't really in agreement um as a team on on you know whether to go down that route so it was a little bit of like trial and error convincing um and i think that uh i you know here's the here's the deal you have to feel, we were trying to make an unconventional biography, right? That's why there are two things that felt to me like the, the, the language of the film that would help us really feel mm -hmm. um, the presence of Yogananda. Right. And that was to really feel the presence of him as a boy, that one that the seeker, the, the one that hadn't been realized, the one that was just still going into, you know, saints homes in Calcutta and trying to get the wisdom and trying to find like, you know, he's so hungry for the wisdom. Um, the, the seeking part of him, we really wanted to be able to show that, to express that, to, 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 to manifest that in some way on the screen. And then his voice, you know, it was trying to, um, really harness his voice. I couldn't believe that, you know, how many people do you know that remember when they were born? They remember right. going through the womb. Mm -hmm. They remember how, oh, Luna. Um, <laughs> they remember how, you know, they actually felt coming through the womb and, and were cognizant of the, the be feeling torn between two worlds, be spirit and like being material in, in the material world. Right. So those two things, finding his voice and using recreations to me were two tools that we could use to help the audience really feel um, that they were in the presence of, of, um, of Yogananda. And that's something that really, I, I felt, I, I reacted to that when I watched it because I did feel that. Um, and I've seen the movie a bunch of times now. And every time when I hear that voice and I see those images, it really does, it just brings the whole thing together. In, in a way that just that interviews and B-roll would have done. And we didn't really have a choice in the matter. You know, there's only like, what is it, a dozen photographs at most of him in his youth and his family or whatever, right. and, you know, it's a visual medium. So we needed some uh, method to tell the story. And, you know, we talked about um, metaphors and visual metaphors. You know, right. we, we talked about all sorts of ways. How do you convey a feeling? How do you convey a feeling right. of longing? You know, and ultimately, you know, you do need actors, and 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 you know, you need to look into people's eyes and have you know convey that feeling. But um, you know, as you said, Alex, when recreations are good, they're fantastic, and when they're bad, they're so. Oh, and, the, and there was the risk. There was yes. the risk of it being bad. You know, right. so that was the thing. You just had to have a lot of you know, um, to, to see it and then just really try to really, and, and Arlene Nelson, our, our DP, I mean, I have to say, I just hand it to her because it was just, she, she really got that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then of course we treated them and did all these things in post as well. And, um, you know, we just had a really great team of people that helped us realize them in the way that, that, you know, we really envisioned it. We studied a lot of films, you know, um, 
Uh, one of the films that inspired us was Man on Wire. Like the, the oh, what a great movie! Oh, uh, I wonderful mean, movie. It really makes the film. So it was, it was those really well done recreations was our point of you know that's what was our aspiration. The magical realism, I think, came from a, a, a Spanish film that Lisa had found. Um, the Beehive, the something of the Beehive. Do you remember the title of that? Spirit of the Beehive. Spirit of the Beehive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful film, and and it it kind of had a language of very very subtle magical realism, and so you know that was a really great resource that that we used as well. Um, yeah. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. As filmmakers, we're always looking for ways to level up production value of our projects and speed up our workflow. This is why I created Enigma Elements, your one-stop shop for film grains, color grading LUTs, vintage analog textures like VHS and CRT images, smoke, fog textures, DaVinci Resolve presets, and much more. Check out enigmaelements.com and use the coupon code IFH10 to get 10% off your order. And now back to the show. Very cool. Now, now you got the movie done. Now, I'm assuming you guys were thinking about marketing and distribution uh, and how to sell this movie during the process, or I have to believe you were doing it during the process, uh, as opposed to at the end going, okay, now what? <laughs> what was the marketing plan? What was the distribution plan to get this out there into the world? So um, we were blessed with making a product in which we had a very clearly identifiable core audience. Mm-hmm. You know, we had Yogananda devotees and there are, you know, by some estimates around 300,000 people worldwide who consider Yogananda to be their guru and are mm-hmm. very, very devoted to his teachings and his message. And then there's another number that we sometimes reference, which is, um, you know, the number of people who have read the book, which is around 30 million. So we had a target. We wanted the sweet spot was between the thirty, you know, three hundred thousand and the thirty million. Somewhere in there was going to be our audience, and we had to figure out, you know, how how to reach them. And we considered, you know, but um, the goal was to go beyond that. Yeah, of course. In in all in all fairness, it was really our mission was to make a film that went beyond that crowd, not to alienate that crowd, Mm -hmm. but to go beyond that. And so we were really looking at the number of people practicing Yoga. yoga. And, and, you know, we had the statistics of how many people were practicing yoga just in the U.S. A they few, did. a couple. A, a couple, just, a 20 couple. million or so. <laughs> Back then. Back then. It was around 20 million. And yeah. now we have the, you know, we have these statistics worldwide, which, you know, are above 350 million. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there were, there, there were those numbers that we knew if we could just tap into even just like 1% of that, you know, we would have an audience. And, um, you know, while we considered very briefly, uh, actually, you know, going with a traditional distributor and sort of handing the film over, um, Paola, you know, on a previous film, we had consulted with this gentleman named Peter Broderick, who coined the <laughs> hybrid distribution. And, um, you know, he's been talking about it for 20 odd years now. And we realized that this was kind of the perfect film to do that. So so we, we, we decided pretty early on to self-distribute that we would you know, um, carve out rights, you know, separate out all our rights and kind of window them out in a sequence that made sense for us, assemble a team. We had around 20 people on our distribution team that we were basically managing, you know, on a standing weekly call. And we created a distribution plan, a strategy of how we were going to roll out these various um, uh, windows and, and take advantage of you know, what Paolo was saying before is, OK, so you identify your core, but then there are these concentric circles or a Venn diagram of overlapping circles. So you've got your Yogananda devotees, you've got your meditators, you've got your you know, wellness community, you've got this. How are we going to get to them all and how, you know, are, are we going to um, uh, go you know, from town to town and, and roll out? And so, in other words, it was something where it was kind of a yogic distribution plan because we were learning about it as we were doing it you know it was really amazing and how did you guys do because i remember you when we spoke before you were talking about your theatrical which i thought was in very interesting way that you guys released your theatrical can you talk a little bit about that process yeah i mean i just want to to also say that um we were realistic about the fact that it would probably be challenging to get this film distributed through a traditional distributor they would have no idea what to do with it (laughs) exactly so you know i I think it's important to kind of just start with that 
Um, and because I think that when you make a film, you, you kind of need to know already, um, you know, number one, who your audience is, you're working backwards in a way, you know, just strategically, if you really want to get it seen. And then, you know, you have to know what you have in your hands. And, and we were playing with something that really hadn't been done before. And so, you know, um, we were prepared to take this route. We had talked about taking this route of, you know, doing the hybrid distribution model. Um, and the advice, you know, that we were getting from Peter, who's, you know, so I really love the strategy that he has, which is um, dipping your toe into, you know, a market. So starting with New York, we, you know, we and we actually four walled um, mm -hmm. in New York. And Los can, can you explain to, to the audience what four walling is? Sure. Um, so what we did was um, the first thing we did was we identified which dozen cities have the most concentration of our core audience, you know, in, in, in America. And that's where we're going to start. And so New York was one of them, Los Angeles, obviously, Encinitas, where, you know, Yogananda had an ashram. There was a couple of other places, Northern California. And four walling is where you basically book that you rent the theater for a week. You rent the right to show your film for four, four showings a day for an entire week's run. And for, in a place like New York, that will cost you around $10,000. But if you know you can fill those seats, you can actually make a lot of money doing that. And we did. You know, In New York, I believe we made $34,000 in that first week. So we had a $24,000 profit just from that one engagement. And then the theater held us over. They said, oh, my God, this film is really performing. <laughs> I, want, <laughs> I want to book this film. So we ended up staying another six weeks beyond that in New York. Without so having to pay for it. They actually exactly. booked it traditionally. Exactly. It turned into a traditional booking. Same thing happened in L.A. and a couple of other markets. In fact, unbelievably, we, we played 23 weeks um, at the Lemleys in Pasadena in L.A., 23 weeks. For on, su on Sunday afternoon. Yeah, it was just on weekends. People just kept coming, yeah. so they just kept it going And on a Sunday <laughs> afternoon. It was just great. Yeah, that was. And so, so you did all of that without thinking or well, you weren't you, you decided to spend the time to do the theatrical run first. And then you were, were going to roll it out. So what was the next rollout? Because you didn't do everything at the same time, obviously. Actually, can I back up um, a little bit before yeah. theatrical? Which is even before theatrical, um, we, we started to create buzz and awareness. We attended a, a couple of conferences, for instance, Wisdom 2.0 in, in the Bay Area, where like high tech meets higher consciousness. And we figured, you know, this is ground zero for us, especially with the whole Steve Jobs connection. Mm -hmm. right. So we convinced the organization to give us 500 copies of the autobiography for free, which we just gave out at that conference. We had a big display, you know, stacking the books with our postcard in the book and, you know, our film postcard in the book. And it says, this is the, you know, the book that Steve Jobs had on his iPad on the at the time he died and it's yours for free. And they like just went like gangbusters. Of course. We of course. Did, did the same thing at the Yoga Journal conference in San Diego. And we were basically getting to, you know, sort of celebrity, you know, yoga teachers and trying to get them interested in the film. And then they started telling their classes about it. So it's kind of considered grassroots in a way. Mm -hmm. We were doing like, you know, pre-screenings um, to kind of create buzz. Mm -hmm. We also did Bhakti Fest in, yeah. in Joshua Tree in, 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 in September. And coincidentally, the Smithsonian was having a, a, a museum, a traveling yeah. exhibition on yoga and the ancient teachings, and we just pigtailed onto that. <laughs> the timing was amazing. You know, I, I do have to say timing is everything. And we this movie took a long time to make, and we kept asking ourselves, like, why is it taking so long? Why is it taking so long? And, you know, just the kinds of things that happened in that time that it got oh, extended yeah. were the things that helped mobilize the film when it w went into distribution. But go back to like the, because he's asking what we were doing, um, the you know, doing, yeah. theatrical on demand along with. Right. So, so, so in, in addition to traditional theatrical, some of it for walling, some of it, you know, booking the numbers in New York made everyone suddenly look at us and want to book us. So we started to get incoming calls, which was fantastic. Um, and we had, um, Richard Abramowitz of Abramorama was our theatrical booker and did a fantastic job. Concurrent with this, we were also doing what's called theatrical on demand, which is how it's like Uber meets, you know, indie dis film distribution, which is um, you can actually get an AMC to show your movie on a Tuesday because they're going to make more money if you guarantee them 700 bucks for that eight o'clock screening than if they show, you know, the rerun of or whatever, the remake of some 
blockbuster that's only going to have 20 people in the audience. So you can actually get your film into practically any theater in America if you get enough people to pre-reserve tickets. And they have an algorithm and a widget that fits right on your web website. We used um, yeah. a company called Gather, and there's another company called Tug mm -hmm. um, that allow you to you know, really get your film. It's all these cool disruptive distribution techniques that w where you can get straight to your audience, cut out the middleman, and you get your data. You get the email addresses of all those people who showed up. And then you can market your ancillaries and your other, you know, um, components to, to that list. And that becomes a very useful list. So we had theatrical, we had theatrical on demand and community screenings. We were also selling DVDs to show in your churches or your yoga studios. And we were just pushing them out on a grassroots level. But this is so, before, before a massive release on DVD or on an SV, SVOD, right? This is before, yeah. way before. Almost one year of this. Okay. Uh, theatrical, theatrical on demand, and community screenings. Community screenings, yeah. So, and then I, I'm assuming during that process alone, the movie became uh, got into the black, or were you still in the red when you when that final before you even got to SVOD? Um, well, it, it did very well. I, it, Good. I mean, we're under sort of an NDA. We can't really disclose numbers. Fair enough. It, it, it did. It did very well. It exceeded everyone's expectations. We had that's awesome. We were in 65 markets theatrically. Mm -hmm. 65 markets in North America. We had 350 um, uh, theatrical on demand screenings and also overseas was crazy. In seven countries, we were in 50 plus theaters for an indie doc. Yeah. yeah. So it was, a, I mean, we didn't, it, it definitely exceeded our expectation because most documentaries don't really do like this kind of numbers in, mm -hmm. in theaters. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, we, we, figured that TV was not going to be probably one of our windows. So we really milked the theatrical and because the theatrical work, it really helped with the DVD sales as well. Of course. So, so then, you know, Netflix came around and kicked the tires. Um, <laughs> just, as um, they do, as they do. <laughs> um, and, you know, we, it's, there's a love hate thing with Netflix and indie filmmakers. I mean, um, but, but back then it was, it was thrilling to be, um, you know, uh, 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 in acquisition talks to, with, with Netflix, um, licensing talks. What was great, though, is that we delayed that deal. We said, you know, we're in no hurry to make that deal. Let's sh keep showing them the legs that this movie has. Mm -hmm. And between their first offer and, you know, whatever it was, a few months later when we finally closed the deal, they had quadrupled their offer on Netflix had. And what was more important is that they agreed to the following windowing. We said, we're going to do DVDs first, digital second, and Netflix third. And, um, and even in the DVD deals that we made, we, we had a deal with Kino Lorber to you know, do brick and mortar DVDs. But we had a co-exclusive deal, which is we were allowed to sell our own DVDs too. And um, Self-Realization Fellowship, Yogananda's organization, has a whole publishing arm where they sell books and DVDs. So we created a companion book, we created our own DVDs, and we basically began with our exclusive window. For one month, it was you, if you wanted to buy the film, you could only buy it from us. Then Kino Lorber kicked in, then digital, then Netflix. Super smart, guys. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's super we had help from people like Peter Broderick. You know, we, we had consultants that we were working with. But because you, oh. you, you, you had a product that was in demand. So, you, yeah. I mean, this doesn't work for every movie. Like, this, this works for, for films that have yeah. an audience that really want that material. Because, like, when I heard about it, it was already on. I saw, I think the first time I saw it was on Netflix. Um, the first time I ever heard of it. Um, but I could only imagine if I would have known about it prior, I would have probably been like, when can I see it? When can I see it? Where can I see it? Where can I see it? When I see it? So that kind of want and need by the audience is what makes yeah. this kind of platform work. Yeah. yeah. Without question. Now, as far as marketing, did you market on, on digital? Did you go social media? Did you do big billboards? How did you market this to those audiences? Yeah. That would have been cool, right? The billboards. Right. Uh, wouldn't that be amazing? Just like driving uh, on like... Sunset, and we wanted to see Yogananda, you know, up on billboards. On Sunset Boulevard, just right there. Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> yeah. Um, you want to talk about our marketing? Um, well, yeah. I mean, we, we quick re quickly realized that, you know, um, this was not a traditional 
film and, and we were going to be um, connecting with our audience in this sort of disruptive, direct way. So obviously social media was our, our, our main uh, friend here. Um, we did, you know, do a few print ads here and there, but they were mostly strategic partnerships. So for instance, um, Yoga Journal and um, LA Yoga was, was one of our partners where we said, okay, we had these really good uh, marketing consultants who said, let's make a, a creative deal with LA Yoga. One, let's um, get them to review the film. Two, let's get you know buy a you know one page ad in, in in the magazine, same issue that they're reviewing. And three, let's get them to host one of the evenings in LA. So in the cities where we were forewalling the film, we would get partner hosts to say, you get the eight o'clock screening. You can do whatever you want with it. You can do a little presentation afterwards, as long as you broadcast your list and fill that house, it's yours. And you know, by doing that, we basically just guaranteed a bunch of sellouts and got really robust numbers. Yeah. So, and that's something that has worked also with with some of our our clients, our consulting clients, because we, you know, that is something that's kind of your grassroots build. Um, you know, I, I think if you mobilize, it takes a lot of work to do this kind of stuff, mm -hmm. and we don't recommend to people that they do it on their own. It will totally wipe you out and exhaust you. You need a team, and so you have to actually build this into your budget. You know, you need, you know, a few assistants, you need a social media team, you need publicists, you need marketing people, you, you really need to create what a distributor would create. Um, and the, the difference is that you're hand picking it and you, this is your baby. So you're going to really go the extra mile that your distributor may or may not do if they don't get immediate results. Right. right. So it's the consistency with which you will shepherd and nurture you know, your film into the world. That's the idea behind the hybrid distribution model. And I, and I think what you, I mean, with this kind of film, it is, it is a poster child for self-distribution. I mean, it has everything that a, a self-distributed film needs to have in order to succeed. Cause I, I, I consult all the time and a lot of times they just don't have an audience or know how to get to that audience or have a strategy, you know, and they're just like, well, I'm going to self, I'm going to put it up on iTunes and that's enough. I'm like, no, <laughs> Yeah, everybody should have Yogananda in their film. That's the key. <laughs> uh, that, that is the key. That's the key to every successful film, obviously. <laughs> you know, another thing, Alex, is that we had um, two uh, Facebook pages. One was sort of public facing open page, you know, which started, you know, really to mushroom and get a lot of traction. And, you know, um, our social media team was, was really good at sort of organically building a really robust group. Mocha Media. But, mm -hmm. yeah, Mocha Media, Glenn and, and Angela Alston. Um, and the other thing, though, is that we had a private page that was only by invitation. And that was for movie captains or anyone who was willing to spearhead a community screening or a gather theatrical on demand screening. And you were only invited into that group after you had you know, initiated a screening request in your community. And then in that group, we gave you all the kind of secret sauce stuff, you know, like the, the playbook and the flyers and the templates. And you would also be able to um, engage with other captains and share secrets and share lists. And, hey, you help me promote in this city and I'll help you promote yeah. in that city. And and that, do they do they get a cut of that or is this just pure love? Not not they, in, in the gather. Can and gather. Yeah, not, not in the gather model. In Tug, in Tug, um, uh, in Tug, uh, they are given 5%, but in the gather model, it's really just for, for the love and the bragging rights of, you know, having pulled off the, the screening and stuff like in that. In your neighborhood or in your, in your town. Yeah. I mean, it is a pretty cool thing if there's a film that isn't going to ever come to your town and you get to actually host a big party, you know, you just have to get people there, but it's your, it's your, you can do what you want. Like they come, you can speak to your audience. You can, it kind of is your own little personal party. And did you guys go on tour with this? No. You oh. guys, like in the movie in general, did you go to different cities and talk? Or? A, cities, a, a, a couple of things here and there, but mostly we were pretty much delegating it to. We did a lot of, actually, you know what? We did do a lot of um, Skype and Zoom calls um, mm. with we, that we did do, but we didn't actually go on tour with all the, you know, we, we just couldn't. We were so tired from having <laughs> done all of this. <laughs> we're like, we'll, we'll zoom in, you know? Yeah, we'll, we'll Skype it in, guys. That's fine. Yes. It's perfectly fine. <laughs> now with your, so when you release it, you release TVOD first, right? Transactional yes. first. Mm -hmm. Then you had your Netflix deal and that Netflix deal lasted, what, a couple years, if I'm not mistaken? It's a two-year deal. 
And now we're in our second um, SBOD, um, which is Gaia. Uh -huh. Now has, has bought it, you know, for, for, for a second run of, of subscription VOD. So. And then that's locked up for a few years. And then after, and you're still selling DVDs? Yeah. Yep. And we're still actually having theatrical screenings. Like, yeah. little, like we just two, two weeks ago, someone said, I want to do theatrical screenings. Really? Yeah. Well, it's yeah. one of those movies that, that makes, like, you want a community. You want that, that communal experience yeah. to watch yeah. that kind of movie. Oh, you know, that's right. And I think that, that one of the things, this is the lesson for, you know, our business. Because, you know, distribution, you can't, distributors, we, 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 end, we tend to put blinders on and say, this is the only thing that will sell, right? right? But if you do uh, find your own audience, like what we found is that this audience that came to see Awake is actually a vast audience all around the world. They are hungry for a certain kind of product that isn't really being produced and isn't being distributed, which is part of the reason why we really wanted to help other films get off the ground in this arena because mm -hmm. you know there's there's a there is room for this not only is there room for it there's a demand for it so you know you just have to find your way into that distribution model and then it all then the rest come now Jeez. and you guys did create ancillary products which i i purchased the book uh I, I definitely purchased the book i love the uh the companion book i haven't bought a companion book in god knows how many years i think the matrix yeah, was the I last that. that wasn't cheap that was nice of you <laughs> no yeah no it's because i i just love the movie so much and i was like i want something else and my, my daughter's got it for me for christmas last year and uh how did you guys go about that was it because of through a self-realization company that they had their arm and they had their marketing to do it I think also it was actually inspired by a review. I believe, you know, the, the Washington Post gave us this really juicy, quotable little um, line, which um, it said that Paula and Lisa were masters of atmospherics, that mm -hmm. they were masters of atmospherics. And we realized that there was sort of a quality, this magical realism thing, you know, that was in the movie. And um, there was a monastic at Self Realization Fellowship who was kind of a Photoshop whiz. And he, um, just started doing these page layouts, which was capturing the feeling of the film, you know, in in this in this other form. And we realized, boy, there's a making of a book here. We can basically have the transcript of the film. Then we wrote some, um, you know, introductory essays and some sort of epilogue epilogue essays, you know, to sort of bookend it. And it became this kind of beautiful product. He, he did an amazing job. I mean, uh, yeah. It's, it's a beautiful just, book. It's a stunning, stunning coffee table book. It was really well done. And did it do well? Did you guys sell a lot of books? It did very yeah. well. It did Re very well. That's amazing. Because like you said, it's not cheap. <laughs> it's not a cheap <laughs> gift. Um, and then one other thing I want to talk about, about the sound, a uh, soundtrack of the movie. Because you actually sold the soundtrack. But when <laughs> I'm listening towards the end, I'm like, is that Alanis Morissette? <laughs> I'm like, how did they get Alanis Morissette for this? How oh, did you get Alanis to, 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 to get the rights to that movie? So amazing. Thank you, Alanis. Um, she, I mean, she just, she had given me a song of hers in, in one of my in, uh, prior films. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd written to her and, you know, she was like, I'm not really sure how you see that being used. But, you know, she gave it to me anyway. And I used it. And I think in the end, it just was just worked so perfectly. And with this, I just remember I was going on walks, going on walks and listening to all kinds of music that would spark something for the movie. And um, that that song still is oh, it's a beautiful so song. beautiful. I remember when it came out. It was a it's gorgeous song. It's so beautiful. Song. And she is so, you know, deeply attuned to these teachings. And, um, you know, it's in, it's in all of her music. I mean, she is like a teacher of her in her own right. I think she's actually teaching, you mm -hmm. know, spiritual giving, giving um, conferences and, and, uh, and she's a spiritual teacher in her own right. So I think that um, she understood the connection with the film. She gave, she was just generous. Mm -hmm. and, but you uh, just, but you just wrote a letter. Originally, you just wrote a letter to her and said, Hey, wrote a letter and, and, you know, a little persistence. We also got, <laughs> we also got a number one. It doesn't hit just happen like that. Yeah. Right. No, I mean, and then we also got, you know, a number one hit single from George Harrison. Right. Olivia Harrison, you know, was generous enough to give us the use of George's yeah. song. And, you know, that's kind of a one-two punch at the end of the film, which is, um, you know, instill um, 
she's kind of singing from the point of view of God singing down to humanity, which is, I love you still, no matter what you do, no matter all these things you mess up, I love you still. Mm -hmm. So here's God singing down to humans. And then, you know, we go our end credits, we have this exalted, give me love, give me peace on earth, man singing up to God, you know, so beautiful. Those, those two songs back to back. Yeah. And still also has the, just the metaphor of stillness, you know, in all of it too. So it's still, it's the persistence and the perseverance of, of that sort of self-realization, but it's also just, you know, you find it in stillness, you know? So, and it's funny now that you mention it, I realized that I actually kind of stopped her. I went to, I knew she was yeah, no, I'm, I'm remembering now at that Wisdom 2.0, 2 .0, 2 .0, at the conference where we, we were did. giving away those autobiographies, she was on the, she was one of the speakers. And so I, through six degrees of separation, had a connection um, through my friend Nell to Alanis. And, you know, Nell was like giving her, giving her the, 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 you know, it was like a little connected tissue to, to her at Wisdom 2.0, where, you know, she texted me and said, come say hi, I'm. I'm leaving now. She left from her thing. I had to catch her like in her limo on her way out just to say hello. <laughs> nice. But that, I think cinch the deal. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. That's, that's the thing about still is that, um, uh, you know, one of the monastics who, um, who was part of the film team um, is actually, you know, a kirtan singer and he just loves music and it's very steep and traditional um classical Indian music. And he pointed out the fact that that song is actually in a traditional rag form. It is in a rag. I forgot the name of the rag, but you know, he, she used, she was clearly influenced by um, India. Yeah. You know? That's amazing. No. So what's up next? What's next for you two guys? <laughs> this is a good one. Well, we, that move, that, I mean, the movie was made and released in 2014. Right. <laughs> Uh, we've, we've worked on other things since then, um, and we are working on a, on a big project right now that's a peace and um, and music festival in India, in Rishikesh, India. And oh, it will nice. have a documentary component to it um, and a live stream, and it will hopefully um, be another uplifting um, focal point. That's awesome. It's, it's called Come Together. It's oh, called cool. Together in honor of commemorating the Beatles going to India 50 years ago and how they moved the needle and shifted the paradigm for so many of us, you know, just open those doors to kind of a new way of thinking. I mean, no, when the Beatles went over there, I did absolutely like, you know, because you had the biggest band ever yeah. <laughs> introduce you to a whole new world in many at ways. The of their career, at yeah. the peak of their career. And I think the idea is that, you know, um, it, they had everything, right? They had reached the pinnacle of success. And for them, it wasn't really enough. And so it was the idea that, um, you know, finding another way to uh, explore our purpose in life and finding balance in life. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really putting a focal point on how to live on the planet. That's awesome. Now I'm going to ask you a few questions I ask all my guests. Um, first one is, what advice would you give a filmmaker wanting to break into the business today? Jump in. <laughs> Shoot it on your phone. You know, th these days, the, the, me the means, the barriers to entry have disappeared. You can edit it on your laptop. You can shoot it on your phone. Jump in, start, do it, do it, and, and see if you really want to do it because it takes a huge amount of work. So, so figure it out. Figure it out by doing it. And oh, the other one is don't go to film school. <laughs> Especially not Harvard film school. I mean, yeah, seriously. <laughs> don't waste all that money on film school. Learn about life. Study philosophy. Join the Merchant Marine. That's what John Huston always yeah. said. Join the Merchant Marine. You want to be a filmmaker? Go visit, you know, learn, learn about the world. And then you, know, you can figure, anyone can figure out how to make a film. And I think for me, it's, it's, um, you know, there's so much emphasis now in the result, the result, the result, the result. And I think it's really impacting um, process. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, I just think that, you know, I, I'm looking to young filmmakers to find a new language, to find new stories, to, you know, really break the mold here. And I just think that, you know, don't don't be result oriented. Let the process, if you're drawn to filmmaking, it's because you're really needing to have expression and a voice and you have something to say. So have something to say. That's kind of where I put, put the focus on having something to say. Now, can you tell me the book that had the biggest impact on your life or career? 
Hmm. Interesting. I mean, I don't know about if I could say it had an impact on my career, but um, a book that has always stayed with me is The Grapes of Wrath. I just, wow, by Steinbeck. Yeah, of course. The journey uh, that, it talk about a path, and <laughs> it's a metaphor, a metaphor for the path of life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it just was such a journey of survival and love and um, finding a way forward, finding a way forward with such elegance and grace and depth. So that, that movie has always stuck with me, um, that movie, that, that book. I actually haven't seen the movie, <laughs> but, but the book really stuck with me. And I don't know if it influenced my filmmaking, but it influenced me as a person. So, of course, it influenced my filmmaking. How about you, Peter? Um, you know, I'm just going to plug, um, I'm so sorry to do this, but I'm going to plug my book. I have a book out right now. <laughs> plug it. To the Gods. What's um, it called? What's it called? It's called Playing to the Gods. And, you know, I spent the last uh, three to five years on it. Um, it actually started as a script. It's got a long story. But anyway, it's a book now. It's on um, out from Simon & Schuster. And it's about the birth of modern acting. Um, a great rivalry occurred about 100 years ago in the theater between these two icons. One is Sarah Bernhardt, the great actress of the 19th century, who acted from the outside in. She acted by imitation. There were books, there were manuals that showed you how to pose on any given line. And then there was this sea change, which is we needed to figure out the original way of acting, which is inspiration from inside out. And this other actress, Eleanor Duza, kind of rediscovered original acting. And they had this intense rivalry. Mm -hmm that went on for decades. They stole each other's plays and lovers and all sorts of things. So. <laughs> you did a great job. It it's would a, make a good movie. It, it's it's, it's, it's it on its way. Yeah, it's, 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 being, it's being adapted as we speak. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Mm. <laughs> Love myself. Oh, that's a good one. We beat yeah. ourselves up a little bit too much sometimes. Yeah, it's just the it's the it's the thing that um, these teachings have really transformed in me, um, which is just to you know surrender and to um, allow, and that has a lot to do with loving yourself. How about you, Peter? I would say yeah, and well, kind of related to that, kind of get get out of the way, get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, and, and let, let it happen without the ego, you know, like, uh, um, that, that's, that's, that's a tricky one. I'm still working on that one. <laughs> <laughs> and the toughest question of all three of your favorite films of all time. Mm. Well, I always begin with the Godfather. It's of course. Still, it is, too. Okay. I'm still on my list. <laughs> yeah. Um, what else do we have? Um, you know, I grew up in Italy, so I'll go to Bertolucci, you know, 1900, or certainly some of the Fellini movies that were so um, influential. Um, you know, Armacord, Roma, um, Casanova. I've seen them all, you know, uh -huh. just an amazing filmmaker. How about you, Paula? Well, uh, two documentaries that really um, had an imprint on me were Crumb. And, I love uh, Crumb. Love yeah. Crumb. And Harlan County, USA. Oh, yeah, uh, that's a good movie. And, um, and, a, and, you know, I would say The Princess Bride. <laughs> <laughs> what well, a classic movie. Oh, that movie. <laughs> it's so yeah, wonderful, I'm that loving. film. And then where can people um, follow your work and, and follow what you guys are doing? Um, our website is thisiscounterpointfilms.com. Okay. Because um, okay. there's another Counterpoint Films in, in Ireland. But ours <laughs> but this is, is. This, this, this is. is. This is. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we got some We have a newsletter. There. And so, you know, that's the, that's the best place if you sign you up sign for the up. newsletter. Um, we don't send many out, so it won't be annoying. Um, but that's, that's the best way to do that. Awesome. Guys, thank you so much for taking the time out to talk to the tribe today and, and really share your process and a little bit of Yogananda's wisdom with, uh, with everyone. So thank you again so much. Thank You're you so, so much welcome. for the opportunity. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure.